Good afternoon, Ambassador Jasta. It's such a pleasure having you here. Dear friends, excellencies, I'm glad that in association with the United States of America's embassy, we are doing this in partnership and hosting Ambassador Jasta for uh, this farewell function where he'll be talking to us about where he thinks uh, the India-US relationship has reached, what does it look like in the days ahead. Ambassador, we've had the privilege of working with you all through your tenure. You've been a regular at the Raisna Dialogue. We've hosted delegations uh, from the United States. And of course, I remember hosting Mickey Haley here in this very room uh, with you. But let me tell this audience, uh, many of you are already aware, Ambassador Jester has had a long relationship with India and with this US-India relationship. Well, he himself has had over 40 years of experience as a senior business executive, law partner, and government official. And he's had, a, in all these capacities, a ringside view of the policy arena. He's been a senior member of both the National Security Council and the National Economic Council. He served as the G7 Sherpa for the United States and as Deputy Assistant to the President for International Economic Affairs. But as I was saying, even before he became an ambassador to India, this old relationship with India as a co-founder and chair of the US-India High Technology Cooperation Group, that was 2002, uh, then as one of the key architects of the next steps in strategic partnership, I think that's a very important name, the next steps in strategic partnership. That was 2004. And that was a time the partnership had already started turning the corner. And it has not looked back ever since. Since then, the India-US partnership has more and more come to be defined by a range of common interests, of common values, an increasing convergence of what we think of the world together. It has become many things, a lot many things, the intricacies of which I'm going to leave to Ambassador Jester to elaborate on. But I must say, Ken, during their st your stewardship, there's been such significant cooperation between the two countries on a range of issues that even you will have a challenge recounting them all. But I would especially like to highlight, I think, if, 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 if you ask me, uh, the two plus two dialogue, which actually formulated a new template for a deeper defense and security partnership between India and the US, uh, which really, that was what held India and the US held hands together and walked. We still have a long way to walk. But yes, that was, that was a great initiation. Uh, we have collaboration in science and technology, such as a joint endeavor between ISRO and NASA for the development and launch of the world's first dual frequency synthetic aperture, aperture uh, radio satellite, radar satellite, and the initiation of the US-India Strategic Energy Partnership that was a ministerial dialogue to consolidate energy ties between India and what is now the world's largest oil producer. But you know, leaving far behind all these major developments in security, trade, technology, one key area, and an area which Ambassador Jester took special interest in, the gender empowerment became an important area of focus. Ambassador Jester saw this institutionalized partnership between the Women's Global Development and Prosperity, WGDP, and SEVA, the Self-Employed Women's Association, which complements the WGDP's Building Resilient Women's Entrepreneurship Project in India. To take women to the forefront of the economy to build entrepreneurial skills. And I think, Ambassador Jester, through you know, all your keen interest in India's civilizational heritage, you have become an inadvertent champion of the incredible India campaign. I think the number of sites you visited, the places you've been to, you, you've been the greatest advertisement we've had for what India is. 
2020, COVID year, has seen India and the US partnership uh, in vaccine development and the collaboration between Novavax of the US and the Serum Institute of India. So there's a huge list. I'm not going to go through all of it. I'll leave all this talking to Ambassador Jesta. Uh, but we've seen certainly what, uh, what is most important, this deepening, this institutionalization of the India-US engagement. And so therefore, I look forward to hearing Ambassador as he looks back and he looks ahead. So welcome, Ambassador Jester, to this gathering of friends and admirers you have. Uh, there are a lot of them who have joined us online because of the format. We could not get them all into this room. But this is not really a farewell because where India and the US are, our paths are going to keep on crossing. And let me warn you that with the new initiative we have just launched in the United States, in Washington, DC, with the new year, Samir and I are going to be hounding you from time to time. Come calling on you, using your expertise to be part of our confabulations there. With that, the podium is yours. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much, Sanjoy, for that very kind and warm introduction, and thank you, ORF, for sponsoring this event today. And I'm deeply touched by all the people who have come here despite the COVID conditions and those who are joining us online. I come before you today to give my farewell address as the United States Ambassador to India. For me, it is a time of deep gratitude and appreciation, as well as one of reflection. It is an honor and a responsibility to represent the United States as ambassador anywhere in the world. But it is a special privilege to be the US ambassador to India. The past three years and two months have been the most remarkable and fulfilling period of my professional life. When Swami Vivekananda arrived at the World's Parliament of Religions at the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago, he exclaimed, sisters and brothers of America, it fills my heart with joy unspeakable to rise in response to the warm and cordial welcome which you have given us. I have felt the same way living and working in India. As with many Americans, Indian civilization, its unique culture and amazing people has long touched me. My parents traveled throughout India in 1966. I vividly remember being enchanted by my father's many photographs of people and places in this country. I have been fortunate to be part of the U.S.-India relationship for the last 20 years as a diplomat, a technology executive, an investor, and a member of several nonprofit boards. But serving as the US ambassador to India and being directly involved in expanding this relationship at every level has been a tremendously rewarding experience. I have tried my best to be worthy of this great opportunity to contribute to our partnership. I am grateful to the President of the United States and the Secretary of State for their confidence and support. I thank as well the Prime Minister of India, the Minister of External Affairs, and my many friends and interlocutors throughout India for your warm and gracious hospitality. You have extended many courtesies to me and worked collegially and constructively with me and my American colleagues. I would also like to thank my wonderful team at the U.S. Mission in India, from our embassy to our four consulates to the many agencies that are represented at our mission. I so much appreciate your hard work, your dedication, and your support. Thank you as well to my colleagues back in America at the State Department, the White House, and throughout the U.S. government. 
we have worked together on many high-level official visits, most notably the President and the First Lady, but including multiple trips by the Secretaries of State, Defense, and Commerce, as well as visits by the Secretaries of Energy and the Treasury, our Ambassador to the United Nations, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, numerous members of Congress, governors and mayors, and many other government, business, educational, and cultural leaders. As this list demonstrates, my government is committed to the U.S.-India relationship at the highest levels. The visits also hint at the breadth of the relationship, which spans the scope of human endeavor. I would submit that there is no bilateral relationship in the world that is as broad, complex, and rich in substance as that of the United States and India. We cooperate on defense, counterterrorism, nonproliferation, cybersecurity, trade, investment, energy, the environment, health, education, science and technology, agriculture, the oceans, space, and so much more. Before delving into the details of our achievements over the past few years, let's step back and recognize the global context for U.S.-India cooperation. The Indo-Pacific region encompasses the world's largest and fastest growing economies and the most populous nations. More than 50 percent of international trade passes through its waters. The region is rich in natural resources and it is fast becoming the center of gravity of the evolving international system. Indeed, the tectonic plates of that system are shifting, marked especially by the rise of China and more recently the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has devastated health and economies in the Indo-Pacific and elsewhere. The region needs stability, leadership, and a democratic model for development that does not threaten the sovereignty of other countries. That is why a strong and democratic India is an important partner to promote peace and prosperity. While our strategic partnership has been on an upward trajectory over the last two decades, the past four years stand out as a time of ambition and achievement in the relationship. The recent growth has been the result of considered thought by leaders in both countries, the commitment of substantial resources, and conscious implementation by government officials. The U.S. government has been dedicated not just to the bilateral relationship, but to supporting India's rise on the world stage. The U.S. national security strategy put it down on paper in 2017 welcoming India's emergence as a leading power and stronger strategic and defense partner. When I gave my inaugural address three years ago, I spoke of our shared commitment to democracy, our broad set of common interests, and the many pillars of our bilateral relationship. Let me now review some of those attributes and the ambition we have brought to this partnership over the past few years in cooperation with our Indian counterparts. As the United States and India work together to sustain the rules-based international order, it is worth remembering that we have been engaged diplomatically for over 70 years. We actually established diplomatic relations in November 1946, several months before India's independence, as Americans supported a free India taking its rightful place in the world. But our diplomatic cooperation has accelerated in recent years, inspiring our leaders in February 2020 to declare this a comprehensive global strategic partnership. Our more recent diplomatic coordination flows from our shared vision of the Indo-Pacific region. While the concept of the Indo-Pacific has been many years in the making, it is in the past four years that our countries have shown the ambition to turn it into a reality. In 2017, President Trump described the U.S. vision 
for a free and open Indo-Pacific as one where sovereign and independent nations with diverse cultures and many different dreams can all prosper side by side and thrive in freedom and peace. And at the Shangri-La Dialogue in 2018, Prime Minister Modi presented India's vision of a free, open, inclusive Indo-Pacific region. The Indo-Pacific is particularly significant for the U.S.-India relationship because it recognizes the reality that India and the Indian Ocean are inextricably tied to East Asia and the Pacific. India's expanding economy is likely to become an increasingly important driver of growth for the region, while trade and investment among the Indo-Pacific nations, including the United States, will continue to provide a major impetus for India's growth. For the U.S.-India relationship, the Indo-Pacific means that at a time of great change and challenge, we see India as a critical partner in preserving and expanding the peace and prosperity that have underpinned this dynamic region. Both the United States and India have adapted our internal institutions to this regional orientation. In 2018, the U.S. Department of Defense renamed its Hawaii-based Pacific Command as the Indo-Pacific Command, or Indo-PACOM. That same year, the Ministry of External Affairs established a new Indo-Pacific Division. And we have come to a consensus on the geographical contours of this region, stretching from the shores of the east coast of Africa to the west coast of the United States. Having articulated a vision and common set of principles for the Indo-Pacific, we have also begun coordinating with like-minded countries to build out the architecture of this region while supporting ASEAN centrality. The United States and India joined with Japan for the first ever trilateral summit in 2018, followed by a second meeting in 2019. And in 2019 and again in 2020, the three countries were joined by Australia for a quadrilateral ministerial. These groupings, which have been supported by extensive expert level engagements, are leading to greater cooperation and ambition on a range of issues, including maritime security, pandemic management, regional connectivity, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, and cybersecurity. As global partners, the United States and India have increased our consultations, information exchanges, and joint efforts relating to other countries in the region and other areas of the world, including training African peacekeepers. We have also enhanced our work together in international organizations and in advance of international meetings. In short, the extent of our diplomatic cooperation has thickened in ways we hardly could have imagined 20 or even 10 years ago. We are now building out the foundation of a stronger Indo-Pacific architecture that will enable us to tackle challenges that lie ahead. Our mission over the next five years and beyond should be to give this endeavor further form and substance, to develop guidelines and, if necessary, even red lines. This should enable all countries to prosper from a region that respects sovereignty, a rules-based order, and the peaceful resolution of disputes in accordance with international law. The United States and India both recognize that much of the Indo-Pacific region, if not the world, is depending on our efforts. As democracies, our two countries are committed to a rules-based order as well as to peace and diplomacy. We have both been influenced by the legacies of Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King, Jr. But we know that not everyone thinks as we do and some choose suicide vests or military incursions. That is why the United States and India are committed to strengthening our defense and security cooperation. In the words of Sardar Patel, cultivating strength to challenge oppression. 
In the past four years, we have purposefully deepened this cooperation to keep our nation safe from a growing array of threats and to provide security beyond our own borders. Our bilateral defense and security partnership reached a new level in 2018 with the inaugural 2 plus 2 ministerial dialogue, a cabinet level meeting among U.S. and Indian defense and foreign policy leaders. This important step reflected our increasingly close defense ties and provided a framework for coordinating and expanding our joint activities to preserve peace and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific. Among our most significant achievements has been the signing of three pivotal defense agreements, one at each of the two plus two ministerial dialogues. At the first ministerial, we concluded the Communications Compatibility and Security Agreement, known as COMCASA, to, ex to enhance the real-time exchange of sensitive information between our two militaries. At the second ministerial in 2019, we signed the Industrial Security Annex to our General Security of Military Information Agreement in order to share sensitive government information with industry and facilitate more industrial collaboration. And at the most recent ministerial in 2020, we signed the Basic Exchange and Cooperation Agreement, known as BECA, to share geospatial information, including nautical and aeronautical data. Each of these agreements was under negotiation for many years. With the ambition of the past four years, we were able to conclude them and further elevate the defense partnership. On top of this, we have continued to enhance the complexity of a robust series of military exercises. This included the first ever tri-services exercise known as Tiger Triumph, which I had the privilege of inaugurating in Visag in 2019. This will now be an annual joint amphibious exercise. And most recently, Australia participated for the first time since 2007 in the Malabar Naval Exercise alongside Japan. As a result of these defense agreements and military exercises, our forces are working more effectively together to keep the Indo-Pacific free and open. Through our growing exchanges, joint training, and postings of liaison officers, we have further increased interoperability between our military services. In 2020, the United States, for the first time, posted a naval officer to an Indian military facility, the newly established Indian Ocean Information Fusion Center in Gurugram. Similarly, India posted for the first time a naval officer to a U.S. combatant command, the U.S. Naval Forces Central Command in Bahrain and we held the inaugural Defense Cyber Dialogue in 2020 with working groups sharing best practices and exploring cyber capacity building. We have also continued to expand our defense industrial cooperation, helping ensure that we have the right equipment and platforms to keep our country safe. The U.S. government and defense industry have increased joint research, production, and defense sales with India and made available some of the most sensitive U.S. military equipment. We granted India in 2018 Strategic Trade Authorization Tier 1 status, known as STA-1. This benefit is normally limited to our closest allies and now enables India to access many of our highly regulated technology items. In the past three years, the Indian military has inducted several U.S. origin platforms, including Apache attack helicopters, Chinook heavy lift helicopters, and M777 ultralightweight artillery. Many U.S. defense items and firms now have a presence in India, creating jobs and drawing on the impressive pool of engineering and other talent here. I participated in the inauguration of the Tata Boeing Aerospace Joint Venture in Hyderabad, 
which will soon be the sole location for production of Apache helicopter fuselages. And I visited the Tata Lockheed Aerostructures joint venture, also in Hyderabad, which supplies all of Lockheed's C-130 empennages and soon will be its source for F-16 wings. In addition, we have deepened our cooperation in the fight against terrorism, remembering that both countries have suffered from this scourge. We established the U.S.-India Terrorist Designations Dialogue in 2017 to coordinate our approaches to designating individual terrorists and groups. And we broadened our training efforts, with India hosting a Quad Counterterrorism Tabletop Exercise in 2019. We have also continued to work with Indian partners on a range of law enforcement issues and established a new counter-narcotics working group to combat the illicit drug trade. Reflecting on these achievements, I believe that no country has as strong and robust a defense and counterterrorism relationship with India as does the United States. Put simply, no other country does as much to contribute to the security of Indians and India. Our close coordination has been important as India confronts, perhaps on a sustained basis, aggressive Chinese activity on its border. We recognize that India desires to produce more of its military equipment within the country, and the United States looks forward to our growing partnership in this effort. As this process unfolds, India will likely need to develop certain key capabilities with the careful use of outside procurements. This is expected to include fighter aircraft, which have the potential to transform our defense industrial cooperation. In our view, defense procurement should not be solely about selecting the lowest bidder, but also about recognizing quality and value over the entire life cycle, and ensuring strategic operability across services, and perhaps even with friendly forces. Already, platforms have given way to systems. And in tomorrow's world, systems will fight systems simultaneously across all domains, air, sea, air, space, and cyberspace. Information and the ability to share and integrate it into broader communications and operating networks will be key. In this security environment, it is worth considering how effectively one piece of equipment will integrate into a broader system and strategy, and whether a particular purchase today will pave the way for or preclude future acquisitions of more sophisticated technology. While we appreciate that India has its own historical and geographical perspective, in today's strategic landscape, it may not be optimal to source equipment across a range of suppliers from different countries. Moreover, as India looks at co-production opportunities, it may wish to focus on manufacturing equipment that addresses the needs of the global marketplace with sufficient demand worldwide to make it a worthwhile endeavor. More broadly, will the evolving international environment require India to adjust how it expresses strategic autonomy? Might practical security needs necessitate building closer operating relationships with a smaller circle of trusted, like-minded partners to best preserve India's independence of action while protecting it from coercion? And with which nations does India have the best chance of realizing its own ambition of a vibrant indigenous defense industrial sector? These are important issues for the government of India to consider. From the perspective of the United States, we would like to do more, including joint planning, and cooperative operations. 
the United States has maintained a longstanding commitment to a free, open, and secure Indo-Pacific. That commitment has underpinned the stability and remarkable economic rise of this region. India's armed forces will find no better partner than the U.S. military. U.S. actions over the past few years and in recent months have reaffirmed this commitment. I fully expect the new administration to continue where we leave off with the choice of how quickly and how far to move on bilateral defense cooperation, largely up to the Indian government. Let's turn to a third key pillar of our relationship, our economic and commercial ties. I have long advocated for opening our two countries to further trade and investment in order to provide increased heft to our economic relationship, complementing our broader strategic partnership. A stronger economic relationship not only would bring benefits in terms of jobs and growth, but would add stability to the Indo-Pacific region. In short, we need to apply the same level of ambition in the economic sphere that we have had in the diplomatic and defense fields. I'm going to focus on pre-COVID-19 economic figures as they provide the most accurate representation of the commercial relationship. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, the U.S. trade and investment relationship with India continued to grow and expand. In 2019, bilateral trade in goods and services had surged to $146.1 billion, significantly up from the $18.6 billion mark when I started working on the relationship in 2001. Two-way trade in goods amounted to $92 billion, while trade in services was worth $54.1 billion. In fact, approximately 16% of India's total exports head to the United States. The United States is now India's largest trading partner and India the 12th largest partner of the United States. The growth in imports of goods and services from the United States has provided India with advanced technology, wider consumer choice, and intermediate components for production lines of Indian companies. These have helped bring India into global supply chains and boost the competitiveness of Indian firms. In recent years, several U.S. companies have also made significant investments or expanded existing operations in India. While cumulative U.S. direct investment in India reached around $46 billion in 2019, the actual figure for all sources of U.S. investment is much higher, with U.S. companies having become the largest investor in India and having contributed over 5 million jobs to the Indian economy. This has included some of the biggest investments in India's history, such as Walmart's $16 billion acquisition of Flipkart in 2018 and the more than $16 billion of investments from various U.S. companies in Reliance Geo in 2020. The bottom line is that no country contributes as much to job creation, consumer choice, technology diffusion, and economic improvement for Indians. An expanding number of Indian companies have also found America to be an attractive destination for trade and investment. By 2019, Indian cumulative investment in the United States totaled $16.7 billion, a 20% increase over 2018 and provided almost 70,000 American jobs. 
as one of the most open and dynamic economies in the world, America welcomes such investment. This is a lot of good news for the economic and commercial relationship. But I would be less than candid if I did not note that there are also frictions and frustrations on the trade and investment front. Despite persistent efforts, we were unable to conclude even a small trade package. Moreover, there are growing restrictions in India on market access for certain US goods and services, increasing tariffs, new limitations on the free flow of data, and a less than predictable regulatory environment for investors. As I have stated on many occasions, given the size of our respective markets, there is plenty of room to expand the flow of goods and services in both directions in order for us to reach the full potential of our economic relationship. The United States has a strong stake in India's growth and prosperity, both because of our longstanding friendship with the people of India and because a strong economy will underpin India's growing role on the global stage. India's economic trajectory after its reforms of the early 1990s demonstrated the power of openness to trade and investment. As former Prime Minister Vajpayee stated, empowerment is best served through rapid economic growth. And only by opening our doors can we usher in the wind of change. It also became clear that Indian firms could compete with any in the world, and that Indian consumers benefited greatly from the availability of higher quality products at lower prices. The United States welcomes steps by India to continue its economic reform measures. All countries today are struggling to discern the economic lessons of the COVID-19 pandemic as they implement policies seeking to promote economic recovery. As with the United States, India would naturally like to enhance its economic security by increasing domestic production and reducing critical dependencies. For all of us, being part of the global supply chain no longer means focusing solely on economic efficiency, but also means factoring in political risks, as well as seeking increased domestic employment and a sound <coughs> manufacturing base. As US and other companies find it increasingly difficult to operate in China or seek to diversify away from Chinese-led supply chains, India has a strategic opportunity to become an alternative destination for manufacturing investments in the Indo-Pacific region. But to fully seize this opportunity, the Indian government may well need to take further action. The current view in India is that the best way to meet these various objectives is through a policy of self-reliance, emphasizing make in India, while still seeking to be engaged globally, participate in global value chains, and be an exporter to the world. It remains to be seen whether all of these policies are compatible and mutually reinforcing, or whether they will lead to higher tariff and non-tariff barriers to trade. The latter would limit India's capacity to truly integrate into global value chains and in the process raise prices for Indian consumers. Ultimately, these will be choices for the government of India. Our experience is that excessively managed markets tend to create inefficiencies, leading to slower growth. On the other hand, trade openness historically has produced positive results for the Indian economy, its job market, and its consumers. The experience of the post-war period has demonstrated that East Asia's success was driven by increasingly open markets at home and deeper trade relations with the West, especially the United States. If we are to be truly ambitious, I still believe that India should seek to lock in the benefits 
of its economic relationship with America by negotiating a comprehensive trade agreement in a fair and reciprocal manner that ensures access to both markets. A fourth pillar of our strategic partnership is energy, where we have made considerable efforts and achieved significant results over the past four years. In 2017, we elevated the bilateral energy relationship into a strategic energy partnership, referred to as SCP. We formally launched the SCP in 2018 and prioritized cooperation in oil and gas, power and energy efficiency, renewable energy, and sustainable growth. The Strategic Energy Partnership has expanded energy engagement through both government and industry channels. The first major activity under the SCP was the U.S.-India Gas Task Force, which convenes key stakeholders to identify opportunities for gas sector growth and market reforms that will accelerate the deployment of natural gas in India. This supports the Indian government's goal of increasing the share of natural gas to 15% of the primary energy mix by 2030. Since 2017, with support from both governments, the United States has become a significant source of energy for India. U.S. crude oil exports to India went from zero in 2016 to 93 million barrels in 2019. And U.S. liquefied natural gas exports grew more than five-fold from 2016 to 2019. Bilateral energy commodities and equipment trade reached $8.8 billion in 2019, more than quadrupling since 2016, and now accounting for approximately 10% of bilateral trade in goods. By 2019, India had become the largest export destination for U.S. coal, the fourth largest destination for U.S. crude, and the seventh largest destination for U.S. liquefied natural gas. Our two countries are also beginning cooperation on the operation and maintenance of our strategic petroleum reserves, including the exchange of information and best practices. All of this has helped diversify India's energy sources with reliable market-based suppliers. In addition, the U.S. has supported the modernization of the power grid in India and the development of energy storage technologies. These include the integration of large-scale renewable energy into the grid, the utilization of smart grids and smart meters by distribution utilities, and the deployment of large-scale rooftop solar power projects. We also established the U.S.-India Hydrogen Task Force to help scale up technologies to produce hydrogen from renewable energy and fossil fuel sources. And Americans have worked with Indians to facilitate high-performance buildings in India that are smart, green, and energy efficient. There are now over 100 U.S. companies of varying sizes involved with energy that have a presence in India. These firms work across all elements of the sector, including power, oil, gas, petrochemicals, nuclear, renewables, biofuels, and energy-related goods and services. They include Westinghouse, which remains hard at work to realize the full potential of our civil nuclear cooperation and provide clean, reliable power to millions of Indians. U.S. investors have also acquired stakes in Indian registered and operated companies that are active in the domestic energy sector. And Indian firms have invested in the U.S. energy sector, seeking to expand access to reliable sources of energy and related technology. As India's economy continues to recover and expand, 
our work together in the energy sector will be increasingly important to our overall strategic partnership. Let me highlight another important pillar of our strategic partnership, one of particular salience over the past 11 months. This is the field of health and biomedicine. In fact, this is one of the oldest and most successful areas of cooperation between the United States and India. Individually and collectively, Americans and Indians have made many contributions to the health of our people and those around the world. Our health dialogue, which last met in 2019, addresses six thematic areas of cooperation, research and innovation, health, safety, and security, communicable disease, non-communicable disease, health systems, and health policy. Our history of successful cooperation shaped our joint response to the COVID-19 pandemic. From the onset of the pandemic, public health scientists from the U.S. Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, known as the CDC, have supported India's COVID-19 field response. They have assisted with technical guidance and training on a range of issues, including contact tracing, diagnostic testing, and infection prevention and control at health facilities. Hundreds, hundreds of Indian graduates of CDC training programs have been at the forefront of India's efforts, providing expertise to prevent, detect, and respond to the COVID-19 virus across the country. USAID has also been deeply involved in working with India on COVID-19 issues. As of November 2020, USAID had helped train more than 46,000 health workers and 79,000 frontline COVID-19 workers, supported 961 healthcare facilities, and worked with the private sector to improve digital health solutions. The U.S. government also donated 200 state-of-the-art U.S. manufactured ventilators to 29 facilities and provided $5 million to support small and medium-sized enterprises in the areas hardest hit by the pandemic. By the end of 2020, the United States had dedicated more than $26.6 million in new funding to support India's response to the pandemic. U.S. and Indian scientists are collaborating to jointly develop and test vaccines, diagnostics, and treatments for COVID-19. Institutions and companies from both countries are partnering to utilize India's large manufacturing capacity for the production of approved COVID-19 vaccines. In addition, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and the Government of India have worked together to ensure the safety and efficacy of medical products and to prevent the marketing of unapproved products that fraudulently claim to fight or cure COVID-19. Apart from COVID-19, the United States and India have in recent years increased cooperation on a new threat to global health, antimicrobial resistance. This occurs when microbes develop immunity to the drugs designed to kill them. I was pleased to help inaugurate India's antimicrobial resistance hub in Kolkata in 2019. Today, U.S. and Indian scientists are building surveillance systems and studying pathogens so they can develop medical countermeasures against this threat. In addition, the United States and India have strengthened cooperation to combat communicable and non-communicable diseases, with a particular focus on tuberculosis. In 2019, USAID and the Indian Ministry of Health and Family Welfare jointly launched the Corporate TB Pledge for the elimination of TB in India and have subsequently received commitments from more than 100 U.S. and Indian corporations. We have also made progress on environmental issues that affect our health. The United States has contributed to India's efforts 
to better understand and monitor air pollution through scientific exchanges, technological collaboration, and data collection. And we held our first U.S.-India Oceanic Dialogue in 2017 to discuss sustainable use of ocean resources for economic growth and exchange best practices on the preservation of rivers and other types of water management. The growth of India's healthcare sector, including the pharmaceutical industry, has contributed to increasing connections between U.S. and Indian companies. More and more Indian healthcare facilities are using equipment designed or manufactured in the United States, while an increasing number of U.S. citizens are consuming medicines developed or produced in India. According to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, India was the second largest supplier of drugs and medicinal products to the United States in our last fiscal year. There remains enormous potential for further collaboration between our health sectors, including as both countries seek to develop new and more secure supply chains for pharmaceuticals and other medical supplies. This is a good news story, not just for the United States and India, but for the health and well-being of people around the world. Let me now turn to our people-to-people -people relationship, which is anchored in approximately 4 million Indian Americans. Although it was trade that first brought us together with the docking of American merchant ships in India in 1784, there has always been an element of mutual fascination and kinship, viewing each other as sisters and brothers, to use the words of Vivekananda, despite the distance. This has inspired travel across the oceans to pursue college degrees, start new jobs, attend medical conferences, conduct Nobel Prize winning economic research, make religious pilgrimages, and much more. A senior official in India once told me that her most precious investment is in the United States. Before I could even imagine what that might be, she added with a smile, it is her children. In Very close to the conclusions. Okay, someone's attending to her? Okay. In great democracies such as ours, governments listen to public sentiment. Our people-to-people -people relationship forms both a strong foundation and a driving force for what our nations can do together. When I first arrived as ambassador in November 2017, then Foreign Secretary Jai Shankar urged me to get outside of Delhi to meet the people of India and really understand this country. And I did just that, traveling to every state and most union territories and meeting with leaders from politics, business, religion, civil society, and cultural endeavors as well as students, shopkeepers, factory workers, farmers, young entrepreneurs, and many others. While I have traveled to numerous countries in my career, I always tell my friends that India, with its history, culture, spirituality, and diversity, is the most fascinating of them all. I can truly say that incredible India is not just a clever advertising slogan, it is a statement of fact. In his Howdy Modi speech in Houston in September 2019, the Prime Minister made this significant statement about India. 
and I quote, our country has different sects, dozens of denominations, different methods of worship, hundreds of different regional cuisines, different clothing patterns, different seasons, which made this land amazing. Unity and diversity is our heritage. This is our specialty. This diversity of India is the very basis of our vibrant democracy. This is our source of power and inspiration. Wherever we go, we carry the rights of diversity and democracy along with us." End of quote. These were powerful words then and are powerful words now. India's embrace of diversity will always be what makes it exceptional. It is a source of strength for this great country and an inspiration for all of us. It is also something to which we Americans can relate just as Indians have long referred to unity and diversity, Americans have long used the Latin phrase, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. Both the United States and India have benefited from our diverse populations with individuals from many backgrounds contributing to all aspects of our societies. That is the promise guaranteed by our constitution. While neither of us is or has been perfect, we understand that preserving our commitment to diversity and tolerance is important to maintaining our status in the world and the strength of our bilateral relationship. When you step back and look at where the United States and India were 20 years ago and where we are today, the amount of progress and achievement is truly remarkable. I do not think that anyone would have predicted this type of relationship when we started working on some of these issues at the turn of the century. Today, the U.S.-India Comprehensive Global Strategic Partnership is strong, positive, and on an upward trajectory. It has been deliberately guided by our governments who have followed the wisdom of Tagore when he observed that you can't cross the sea simply by standing and staring at the water. Leaders in both countries have recognized that getting this relationship right is important for us and for a free and open Indo-Pacific region. It is worth noting that each recent U.S. administration has successfully built upon the work of its predecessor in enhancing ties with India. I am proud of what we have accomplished over the past four years, and I am confident that the next U.S. administration will continue this trend. The United States remains committed to this region and to India because our future is inextricably linked to it. It is a durable commitment supported by the desires of our citizens, our common democratic principles, our shared interests, and our economic and commercial ties. And America's support for India's rise as a global power is clear across our political spectrum. As ambassador, I have dedicated myself to bringing our countries together, knowing the significance of this endeavor in today's world. I will always remember how people from all parts of India receive me as the representative of the United States with kindness, respect, great warmth, and tremendous generosity. It was a daily reminder of how far we have come in the U.S.-India relationship, of how much we have achieved as a result of our ambition, and of how this relationship has made a positive impact on individuals across both of our countries. I began my tenure as a friend and a fan of India. My admiration for this great country has only grown. I will always be grateful for the opportunity to engage in such a meaningful and satisfying job, one that I have enjoyed immensely. Please know that I am forever a close and dear friend of India.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. And can I request um, Indrani Bakshi to conduct the next segment? We'll take a few questions, probably pose a couple of our own. Indrani needs no introduction. Indrani, over to you. Thank you, Ambassador Justin. Uh, that was a good report. That was a good. Uh, that was four, three and a half years in one in an hour. It's quite something. Um, so uh, I will use my privilege of being the U.S. Um, as a journalist, I'd love to ask. I want to ask you, uh, what did that uh, cooperation look like in the last six months? Um, but on a larger scale, um, the question that one uh, is always confronted with is, is this the depth of this relationship? Uh, are, we, are we about to hit the speed bump called CAPSA? Uh, because is, what, is the, what are the real possibilities of uh, sanctions being imposed on India in the same way that they have been imposed in on Turkey last month uh, for, our, for India's purchase of the S-400 from Russia. And uh, given, as you spoke about, India's legacy uh, purchases and legacy relationship with Russia, um, what is the future of the defense uh, relationship with the U.S.? Okay, uh, thank you for that question. The CATSA sanctions were never designed to harm friends and allies. They were aimed at a particular uh, country. And there are many variables involved in it. And I think, from my perspective, I would put that issue to the side because I see other issues that potentially affect the future of the defense relationship. You know, in many respects, India and these are decisions for the government of India, seeks to keep its options open and purchase from many countries, but there are also limitations that it imposes and choices that might ultimately need to be made. Because as I alluded to in my speech, as, information, as uh, systems get more technologically advanced, country a, that does not get along with country B, will be less uh, willing to sell technology that could potentially be compromised to country B. And so we haven't hit that point yet, but that could come uh, down to in the future, and that will be an issue that there are trade-offs. India has to decide how much it matters to get the most sophisticated technology, how much it matters to be as interoperable as it can be within its technology and potentially with other friendly forces, and how much it matters to diversify its sources of procurement. And only the government of India can decide those trade-offs, but that could be a constraint that ultimately affects the level of sophistication at the highest end of the technology transfer and the broader defense relationship. As I said, one could not have imagined 20 years ago that we'd be at the point we are in terms of the level of interoperability, in terms of our joint training and exercises, in terms of our uh, uh, exchanges and liaison officers. And it's going to be, as I also said, in part up to the choices that the Indian government makes as to what the ceiling is on that cooperation. From the U.S. perspective, uh, We'd like to do more, and in a sense, I think you're pushing on an open door. Uh, I, I noticed you artfully skipped the bit about 
the cooperation of the last six months and what did that look like with India? Well, you know, it's really not for me to get into what's occurred in the last six months. That's for the government of India, but I think it's clear that we have been very supportive. But as I indicated in the speech, we both share a vision of the Indo-Pacific region and the principles behind it, and that is an inclusive vision that provides opportunities for all country to grow and prosper, but also wants to avoid uh, incursions uh, of any type, intimidations, predatory financing, and when there's a situation that is indicative along those lines, we've cooperated to try to resist it. Um, you will be, just since uh, uh, we are uh, literally, uh, literally at the cusp of between two administrations in the U.S. And as you have uh, uh, correctly stated, the last four years have seen an extraordinary level of activity between the U.S. and India. Um, if you were to gaze into a crystal ball, uh, how much of this will, will be retained by the next administration? And uh, where do you think we will face the speed bump uh, as we go forward? Well, you know, as I noted, U.S. policy toward India has been bipartisan and has continued to build on the success of the previous administration, even when there have been changes uh, in the party. And the incoming administration with the president-elect and the person who's been named to be Secretary of State are people who actually have experience in dealing with India and favorable experience. And while they have not yet named the Assistant Secretary for South and Central Asia or the next ambassador, who I like to feel have an important role on the relationship, at the strategic level, I think things will continue very much as they have been. There may be nuances and differences. I'm not really the one to say what those will be. But strategically, I think it will be aligned with the things that we have done. It's been interesting, after the election, there are a lot of articles saying, what will the administration do? What does this one say? What does that one say? But I also think it should be flipped around, and the government of India should be thinking, there's a new administration coming in. What should we do to take advantage of that? What types of issues should we take off the table? Should we promote to advance the strategic relationship and shape the partnership in the way that we want to? So it shouldn't be, in my humble opinion, sitting back and waiting to see what the U.S. administration does, it should also be India saying, how can we take initiatives that will push the partnership in the way we want it to go? Right. Uh, I'd like to now open up uh, the questions from the audience. Uh, uh, Ambassador Mohan Kumar. Uh, Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Jester. My question is about trade policy, economic and investment, and I, I readily concede the frustrations and the friction that you talked about. Uh, it could also be described as mutual. But if there are two things that um, you think the United States would wish of India, let's assume you have a wish list, and if I requested you to name those two things which are absolutely imperative, for putting the trade and economic relationship on a surer footing, what would those two be, number one? And number two, do you share my worry that trade and investment is turning out to be the weakest link in this broad-based relationship that you so wonderfully explained? Thank you. Yeah. So let me begin with the second and then come to the first. As I indicated, uh, and as one of my colleagues once sent, said about the trade and investment relationship, it's never been better. And by that I mean it has grown each year in a positive direction. And I hope and expect that will continue to be the case. But what is frustrating is I don't think it's come near to fulfilling its potential. And I think it's very important for the economic growth of India. I, I, a lot of the trade issues that I am talk about should not be seen, in my view, as making concessions to the United States. It's things that I think are in India's own self-interest. And the one I would point to most of all is openness. I think India's own history shows that when it opened, 
in the 90s, growth took off. Uh, and it has steadily gone in that direction, but I would indicate, according to the WTO statistics, in the last few years, it's actually taken a bit of a turn toward lowering the openness. In fact, the applied tariff rates in India have gone from 13.22% to 17.83%. Same period, and it's a misperception because people think the United States has been more protectionist in recent years. U.S. tariff rates, applied tariff rates, according to the WTO, were 4.93% in 2016 and are down to 4% in today. I think trade openness advances economic growth. It gets you into the value chains. The value chains mean you have to take in efficient exports of parts and components, add value, and export it back out. I think it increases consumer choice. I think it adds to job growth and to overall economic growth. So that, to me, is what I would see from my background in business and economics as the most important thing. But that, again, is a choice for the government of India. And as I said, I don't think it should be viewed as a negotiating concession, but as something in your own interest. Now, I also recognize that post-COVID or during COVID, people are trying to say, well, gee, we don't want to be quite as dependent on this country or that country. And I understand that. And we all want to make sure that we have sufficient access to critical matters within our own control. But we ought not overcorrect. And we ought to try to make sure that we can work with trusted, like-minded partners to continue to build our economic strength, which is essential for modernizing the military, for providing jobs and the like. And I think the best way for India to do that is to lock in its benefits with the United States. We're your largest trading partner. And the last thing you want is where we start to reduce that access for one reason or another. Lock it in with a free trade agreement that has to be you know, mutually beneficial, but I think would be tremendously uh, important for long-term economic growth. Um, thank you. Vishnu. Good afternoon, Ambassador. A wonderful uh, speech, and it's, uh, it's sad in a sense that you're leaving this country. I just wanted to ask you about a few of uh, your references on the China situation. Um, did the U.S. alert India on the possibility of China getting set to make incursions in Ladakh when they were about to start? And how extensive has real-time information sharing been as China did make those incursions? I ask because information sharing at all levels has been a key part of this relationship. Well, look, I appreciate the question and the interest in the internal discussions on China, but it's not really something I'm at liberty to get into here. You know, if the government of India wants to comment on that, that's for the government of India. Suffice it to say that we have cooperated, and I think it's been very positive and uh, very supportive. But I really can't get into the particulars uh, at this time. Uh, Sahasan? Ambassador, thank you uh, for that very comprehensive uh, uh, look at Indo-U.S. relations. I wanted to ask a little bit about the neighborhood and Afghanistan in particular. It would seem that that became an issue by the end where India and the U.S. were not really meeting, uh, you know, seeing eye to eye. Uh, there was the U.S. Uh, special envoy calling on India to open talks with the Taliban. That didn't happen. India has consistently said that the U.S., should not attempt to pull out of Afghanistan without sticking to some of its original red lines. Uh, Mr. Trump's South Asia policy announced in 2017 doesn't seem to have really been followed through. There's no ceasefire before the talks began in Doha. We haven't seen, um, uh, you know, uh, the U.S. troops withdrawal sticking to anything but its own timeline, not to, uh, and violence continues in Afghanistan. I wanted to ask about the India-U.S. relationship when it comes to Afghanistan, has, has that been a, a place for perhaps disappointment? For, for what did you, what was the place for what? A disappointment. Okay. First of all, Suhasini, I thought following on my inaugural address, you were going to ask what's the next big initiative in the U.S.-Indian relationship. Uh, that's an inside joke between us. Look, we have consulted a lot on Afghanistan. That's a de very difficult issue. 
the United States has spent an enormous amount of blood and treasure in Afghanistan over the last 19 years. And it was simply not sustainable for us to continue to do that as much as other countries in the region might have liked that. And the government of India has uh, been very understanding of the fact that we could not continue that level of support and involvement. And so we have to create this transition process. It has not been easy. It is a complicated country. You have every other country on the outside trying to affect what's going on. Uh, and it's going to be a process that the new administration is going to have to make some decisions on itself. Uh, and it's one that we're going to have to continue to monitor together as partners. We share a concern in obviously wanting to have stability, of wanting to make sure there's no terrorist activity that emanates from Pakistan that affects India or the United States. Uh, but it's a challenge. Uh, there's just no doubt about it. And it's one where we're going to have to continue to consult. I, I will say this. We've had our special representative for Afghanistan, Zal Khalizad, has come here on numerous occasions, including in the very midst of the COVID crisis, when I met him at the airport and the entire place was like a you know, ghost town. Uh, and uh, he's come in on several occasions. He's communicated. And we have worked together with the government of India. It's just not, it's, it's one of the real challenges going forward. It's not an easy, easy issue. Uh, thank you very much. And I think we have to bring this to a close. Samir, would you like to deliver the word? Ambassador for his um, friendship, leadership, and of course his belief in the relationship and for all the work that he's done uh, while he was in India and uh, when he was in his different avatars uh, in the United States. We are going to keep calling on him as we begin our journey this year uh, in 2021 in, in the United States um, and uh, uh, to uh, honor his term here and to recognize his contribution, let me request my colleague Tanubi to present him with a memento, um, and hopefully you will save it in your living room in New York. And um, uh, when I come there, I'll certainly want to see it. So thank you very much, Ambassador. I have one housekeeping announcement. Do pick up this copy of this publication that the American Embassy has brought out on this occasion. It's on, uh, in the foyer on your way out. There are tea and refreshments. Be careful, be safe, stay masked, and do the miracle eat through the mask. There's also an outdoor space. Use that more uh, for your conversation. So thank you for joining us, and uh, please join us next time.